uh, finish up our discussion of external flow. Um, I just want to talk for a second. Um, so we're going to talk briefly about creeping flow again. So, so far we've um, really only talked about creeping flow or ultra low Reynolds number flow uh, through videos, right? On, uh, you know, uh, through YouTube videos. Um, but, uh, you know, so remember at, at very, very low Reynolds number, Reynolds number, we say much less than one, right? Less than less than one means much less than one. Um, there is no inertia. Um, and we've seen, uh, for example, uh, that if there's absolutely no inertia, then there's no mixing um, of, the, uh, you know, of, of the fluid. And so we can unmix a fluid. Um, it also has consequences for how microorganisms swim, right? Because any motion is uh, exactly reversible. And so if a microorganism is, you know, wab, uh, like waving its uh, flagella, it can, um, and if it's moving it back and forth in a symmetric motion, um, it will just move its body back and forth a little bit. Um, and so we call this regime creeping flow or Stokes flow, right? Uh, Dustin from Smarter Every Day calls it ultra laminar flow, but that's not really a technical term. Um, we would call it creeping flow or Stokes flow. Um, in practice, if you haven't encountered that double less than sign, um, means much less than. Um, uh, it means that uh, it's, you know, we're outside of an order of magnitude, so um, of one. So in practice, it's less than about 0.1 or so. We call that creeping flow or, uh, or Stokes flow. Okay. Um, and this is an image from Van Dyke and album fluid motion. Um, this is a sphere at Reynolds number of 0 0.1. Uh, Anyone tell me what direction the sphere is moving? Left or right? We feel probably left because that's the convention, right? Um, but it's actually symmetric, right? So you can't tell from this image uh, what direction um, it's moving. Now, this is very different from, right? Is there, I can't quite see if there's an asymmetry. There might be an asymmetry in illumination, but the flow pattern looks the same. Um, the, uh, now this is very different from at higher Reynolds number, um, you know, we tend to see a wake right behind the sphere, but, um, if it's moving, uh, but at very low Reynolds number, this is Reynolds number 0 0.1, right? So in this creeping, um, flow or Stokes flow regime, the, uh, the streamlines around the sphere, the flow around the sphere is symmetric. And so from this image, um, it's actually really hard to tell. Um, what's, uh, you know, which direction it's moving. It's theoretically impossible to tell unless they made some mistake in their experiment. Um, so, uh, but so at this, in this regime, this is an important regime for external flow um, because in this regime, uh, well, first of all, in this regime, you could directly solve the average Stokes equations for the drag force on the sphere. Um, this would be the Stokes drag law. Um, has anyone seen this before? Anyone here doing the settling uh, viscometer lab in this room? Everybody in this room, okay. Um, yeah, some people who aren't here today uh, in person. Um, but yeah, this is um, essentially how you find the drag force on the sphere on, um, you know, on a settling particle in the, in the capillary viscometer lab. Um, but this assumes that the Reynolds number is much less than one. Um, and, um, or it assumes the Reynolds number is very low. We'll talk a little bit about limit on that in just a second. Um, so the corresponding coefficient of drag. So if you were to take this, we can then turn this into a coefficient of drag um, and you end up with 24 over RED, um, right? So uh, actually very much reminiscent of friction factor that we solved for in laminar flow. Um, the difference is that uh, that friction factor for laminar flow inside of a pipe that was valid up to about Reynolds number of about 2000 or so. And this is really only valid for a Reynolds number of less than about one. So in, uh, this, the full solution is really only valid for very, very, very low Reynolds number, like less than 0.1 or so. Um, but in practice, this is pretty good up till Reynolds number of about one or so. The deviations aren't too large. Um, so, um, uh, so this is, for uh, the solution for creeping flow around a sphere or comes from the solution for creeping flow around a sphere. 
um, which is something we actually do, uh, you know, the full math of in grad fluids, if you're interested. Um, if you're interested, then grad school's for you. Um, but uh, it, why we talk about it here is that it's useful for analyzing not only how the capillary viscometer works, um, but also how particles settle out of solution. Um, the only, like you may have to, the only caveat, so you may have to worry about how dilute the suspension is. So this works for a single sphere falling through um, the fluid in isolation. But if you have a lot of uh, spheres falling through together, um, then uh, they can start interacting with one another. And then you no longer can make what we call the dilute assumption. Um, so Westec, right, local company does water treatment. Uh, they spend a lot of time thinking about, um, or they have to think about this in analyzing how uh, particles fall out of solution for um, wastewater treatment. Um, and actually had some students sponsored by West Tech a few years ago do a senior project actually looking at deviations from this Stokes law um, on um, uh, data of particles uh, falling out of solution. It's a cool project. Um, but uh, so places where thing where like you might use this this kind of analysis as a starting point at least, right? So are, are any kind of a settling process. So this is kind of caught tailings pond, um, right? So there's a smokestack. Uh, that we see at the um, uh, base of the ochres, um, you know, right near the Salt Lake, here's Route 80. Um, and those giant things over the berms from Route 80 towards the ochres are tailings ponds where we're actually, where minerals are settling out of, um, of, uh, of water um, and creating these, you know, this enormous uh, mining waste um, tailings piles. Um, but within this, uh, we have tiny, tiny particles, right, of, of minerals that are in suspension and um, uh, are, are falling, right, through that liquid by gravity. And each of those tiny particles you can think of as having a Reynolds number, certainly much less than one, um, because they're so small and they're falling just by the influence of their own weight um, or their own, uh, yeah, their own weight. Um, related to the amount of water they're um, displacing. So they're on buoyancy. Um, and uh, you know, they're falling roughly in accordance with this. It's probably not a dilute suspension, right? So you'd have to um, account for the interaction of those particles on one another. But if we had a single particle um, uh, sitting on its own, um, it would be falling according to this, according to this law. Um, Okay, any questions on that? So that's essentially all we have on creeping and Stokes flow um, that fits within the scope of this class. Um, that plus, I guess, the concepts that we've seen in videos about how um, uh, this kind of ultra low Reynolds number creeps, uh, sorry, creeping flow or Stokes flow is reversible, time reversible, it's an important concept as well. Um, but any other questions on this? Okay. Um, I think one of the, uh, Examples that I intend to record um, on video and post to YouTube will involve that creeping flow as well. Um, okay, so uh, now uh, some general notes on drag. Um, so if we look at, um, well, first of all, let's start here. So we have, we have a plot of coefficient drag versus Reynolds number. Um, that blue line running through the whole um, plot is a drag on a sphere. At the low Reynolds number uh, range, that would be Stokes drag law 24, coefficient of drag is 24 over RE, comes from the solution we saw just on the previous slide. Um, and actually here's a pretty good place to see. So we said it's technically that full solution is really only valid. The full solution for flow around, uh, creeping flow around a sphere is only valid for Reynolds number less than 0.1 or so. Um, but when we compute the coefficient of drag, you can see it's pretty close to experimental data up to Reynolds number about one. Um, you know, if your Reynolds number is 100, uh, it's really not a good approximation. Um, Reynolds number one, you're, you're still in, in good shape. Um, but another thing that we can see from this data is that at high Reynolds number, right, as we move out towards high Reynolds number, you know, past the turbulent regime, the coefficient of drag becomes nearly independent of Reynolds number. Um, Again, almost just like what we saw in, well, very similar to what we saw in, in the flat plate coefficient of drag data, 
um, as well as what we see in uh, friction factor data, right? At a very high Reynolds number, um, we see an independence of Reynolds number. Um, so this means that in practice with coefficient of drag, you'll often see like for coefficient of drag on a car, I think we'll, we'll have some data um, on that in just a second. Um, oftentimes you'll just see a single coefficient of drag number posted, right? And, you know, cars travel at a range of speeds, uh, you know, so how can there possibly be a single coefficient of drag? Um, you know, if you know, if coefficient of drag is dependent upon Reynolds number and Reynolds number depends on speed, um, and then, uh, you know, you might think it doesn't make sense. If you think about it for a second, it doesn't make sense for there to be a single CD number reported. Um, but the reason that we often will only see just a single coefficient of drag number reported is that we're just limiting ourselves to this high Reynolds number area um, where uh, the coefficient of drag, where these lines flatten out, and we don't really see a change in CD with Reynolds number. Um, so that means uh, if you see just a single coefficient of drag reported for something, it's probably at very high Reynolds number, right? Um, so uh, a consequence of this, so if we go back to what we learned in chapter five about modeling, um, this means as long as our Reynolds number is above about 10 to the sixth or so, somewhere in this range, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth, um, then we can use geometrically similar models to find the coefficient of drag. So this is the basis of wind tunnel testing. You know, so if you ever see, again, to go back to the car example, um, you know, in the design phase of, of a car, at least pre-CFD, um, you know, one way to, to do wind tunnel testing without building the full-size car um, would be just to build a small like foam model of what the car shape is. And then you could estimate what the drag, what the coefficient of drag is. And that's typically done in a wind tunnel with uh, air. Um, and you can't go too high velocity or else you start um, approaching the speed of sound, right? And then your testing would be invalid. Um, so uh, the only reason, so, the re so full Reynolds number matching is not really possible in that situation. Um, but um, as long as the Reynolds number is greater than about 10 to the six or so all, all over that model, um, it doesn't really matter. The coefficient of drag doesn't change that much. And so you can use the coefficient of drag you find from the model to predict the coefficient of drag for the full size car. Um, so another note here is that to calculate power, the power required to overcome um, aerodynamic drag, and you're gonna see this on a homework um, problem uh, that comes from the exam, that comes from a previous exam, um, it's going to be the force times the velocity, the drag force times the velocity. Um, remember, drag force, one half rho CDA times uh, U squared. So now we have a U in here again, and we end up with U cubed, right? So, um, so this is highlighted in red uh, because the um, uh, aerodynamic, the power required to overcome aerodynamic drag goes as the third power of velocity. Um, so uh, and then your, your textbook goes through one example of uh, how we can then incorporate this with other um, you know, power requiring components in order to figure out the total power required to say move some kind of vehicle. And the um, exam problem that you'll have as practice um, also does something like this. So the total power is then aerodynamic power plus all other, you know, uh, power consuming things so like rolling resistance or gravity. So in your textbook, there's an example with, um, uh, you know, trying to estimate the uh, gross engine horsepower required to move a truck down the highway. And you're given some relationship for rolling resistance as a function of uh, speed. Um, and you're asked to then compute the power requirements to overcome air resistance. Um, the sum of those two is then, you know, this gross, your know, basically productive force power that, that's required. Um, the example on the exam um, uses gravity as the, as the thing you're trying to overcome. It's a bicycle rider going up Guardsman Pass. You've seen this. If you look, flip through the uh, sample midterm, um, it was a problem type that we hadn't quite gotten to, but now you have enough to, to tackle. Um, so uh, 
sometimes you're going to see um, coefficient of drag values um, given as uh, CDA. Um, and I'm just going to flip to the next slide. Actually, I should have uh, removed this from this slide. Um, so sometimes we're going to see uh, coefficient of drag values given as CDA instead of CD. And we talked about this um, a few days ago as well. Um, but what are the, uh, if we see CDA values reported, what are the um, dimensions of CDA? Length squared, right? Because it is an area. Um, so it should have dimensions of length squared, often reported in uh, units of like meter squared. Um, so it's called drag area, um, has dimensions of length squared. It's used for objects with complex shape like a motorcycle or bicycle. So this is uh, data from CFD, actually in ANSYS Fluent, on uh, coefficient of drag or CDA um, for bike riders in all kinds of different positions. Um, and uh, basically trying to see like what kind of um, uh, position is the fastest position in which to, def to descend a mountain pass. And these are real positions that are, actually some of these are uh, illegal now in, in pro racing, but you know, you'll see people, like for a while people were like sitting basically on the top tube of the bike, have essentially zero control, but they can move really, really fast down mountains. Um, but CDA tells us um, is, is a really um, efficient way of figuring out what we're comparing these different positions. There's one thing I'll note here. Which one, uh, which one are you uh, most impressed by? <laughs> Top right, yeah, Pantani. So it, that's actually, he's actually supporting his chest on the seat. Yeah, uh, which is insane. Um, also illegal now, but so uh, one reason why we use CDA here, right? It's not immediately obvious, but that one there in the top middle is actually the lowest coefficient of drag, but not the lowest CDA. Because in that position up top, there's just a little bit more um, frontal area that's being presented uh, to the wind um, that results in an overall lower drag force per unit area. Um, but when you combine it with the area that the rider occupies, it's actually not the um, uh, it's actually the low it's it's not the lowest CDA overall. The more extreme example is this Superman position, <laughs> which they also tested. Um, there's a video. Maybe we might do an abbreviated uh, YouTube uh, on Wednesday just to see someone riding in this. Yeah, there's someone riding down. Yeah, this is. Um, so one thing though, this position has the lowest CDA because the area is incredibly tiny, right? So I show this to illustrate this concept. The area here is incredibly small, right? There's no legs or something sticking out into the wind, um, but it's actually not the lowest CDA. The lowest CDA is still that position up above in the middle. Oh, sorry, the lowest CD, sorry, is still that position up above in the middle. This um, has the lowest overall um, CDA because the area is so low, but the coefficient of drag itself is actually a little bit higher in this position um, than it is in that top tube three. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the bigger issue is that there's essentially no control, right? You know, it's like, no, can't pedal, can't brake, can't steer. You can lean, they do steer. Yeah. <laughs> um, All right. So yeah, the whole point, and the whole point is just to go a little faster, right? Just a little faster down a hill. Um, so this is one, so this illustrates one use of CDA, right? So we have something complex like this. Um, in practice, so this is all done with CFD. So um, you can estimate, you can figure out what the drag force is, and you can figure out what the frontal area is. So you have a nice uh, CFD model that you've built in the computer and you can measure the frontal area. Um, and so using this, you can estimate the, um, so this is the frontal area of the Superman position. You know CDA, you can compute the coefficient of drag, right? Um, but in practice on a real rider, even in a wind tunnel, um, it's difficult to measure, you know, even this frontal area, but you can measure drag force and from that estimate CDA. So for complex objects, um, 
uh, CDA is really uh, useful for making, is, is really a lot more useful than just coefficient of drag for making comparison among uh, different uh, positions, right? So if you're trying to choose whether to risk your life in the, the Chris Froome position or top tube three, you'd go top tube three um, because it's, it's much faster. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but uh, of the legal positions, yeah, this like back down one, this is, this is still legal and it's uh, a little bit more control. Um, uh, we can also use CDA to compare uh, drag force for a given speed. So again, to come back to, to cars, so Tesla Model S has a coefficient of drag of 0.24, which is better than a Prius, right? A Prius is 0.26, um, but a Tesla Model S is bigger, right? Physically larger um, than a Prius is. And um, so they actually have the same CDA of about 6.2 square feet. Um, so uh, that means that for a given speed, despite the fact that a Tesla Model S is a little bit more aerodynamic in terms of the coefficient of drag, um, they would each require the same power for a given speed to overcome over aerodynamic drag, right? Um, and that's captured by this product of CD times A, right? So it's another place where CDA is, is, is really useful. Um, So another final note on drag is that there are many other methods that we can use to reduce drag other than shape. Um, we don't really the, kind of go beyond the scope of, of things that are in this course, which is kind of interesting to note. Um, so one is adding polymers to the flow, right? We can add some material to, um, uh, you know, if we're trying to reduce drag on a ship, this has been tried. We could add some polymers to the, um, you know, to the water to reduce drag around the ship. That's probably pretty awful for the ocean. So it's not really used, um, but, uh, but it's certainly possible. And, you know, polymers, all kinds of additives are added to, you know, to long pipelines, right? To reduce, um, to reduce drag in pipes um, for similar reason. Um, another um, area that your textbook notes is an area of active research. Um, actually in years past, I have a friend who did his PhD in active flow control and he used to come in and give a lecture so he's since moved on from, uh, from Salt Lake, but um, I worked in the area of active flow control. So active flow control is the area of using essentially what you would learn in your controls class combined with what you learn in fluids class about boundary layers and external flow um, and try to uh, develop methods to you know, merge the two together um, and actively inject uh, momentum or um, you know, uh, or otherwise uh, change the boundary layer around complex objects in order to, for example, reduce separation um, over an airfoil in changing conditions um, or to reduce drag. Um, and uh, so there are actually many opportunities for, you know, even more complex engineering um, in order to reduce drag um, in this way. Uh, all right, so any questions on drag force? We're gonna talk about lift very briefly, but any, any questions on drag? Okay, great. Um, and if, if you really wanna know more about all of this, um, this, uh, this is the citation, you can look it up. Um, this, this guy Blocken has a whole number of different papers. He does a lot of CFD on bike stuff, which is interesting. Um, okay, so lift forces. Um, so drag is not the only aerodynamic force that a body can experience in external flow. So if we have a, um, you know, some kind of, uh, in this case, I'm showing an airfoil, we have flow coming in in this direction. Um, this, uh, this kind of shape will experience, right? So it's not, it's not symmetric, you know, um, across the top and bottom. Um, and so this kind of shape will experience a net force. So this is the net force vector, right? Kind of diagonally up and back. Um, and drag, what we call drag and what's described by that CD or CDA um, is just the component of that force that's in the uh, flow direction. That's the drag force. So the component of this force, which is perpendicular to the flow direction, um, we call that the, uh, the lift force, okay? So the net aerodynamic force is, is headed up in this direction. The component, which is 
uh, perpendicular to the flow, we call lift, right? Um, so, uh, I mean, it's really just a single force, right? This total aerodynamic force. Um, we just split it into these two components for convenience and analysis. Um, so we call the component of force in the flow direction drag and the component perpendicular to the flow direction is lift. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about where lift comes from in the last two classes. I feel like coming out of a fluids class, you should be able to give some explanation of how an airplane flies. Um, and so we're gonna cover that at the, at the end. Um, you know, aerodynamics is not a, um, this kind of aerodynamics is not typically, um, it's not something we're gonna focus on in, in chemical engineering fluid mechanics. Um, although certainly it's important in like wind turbine blades and some of you may be going to work in, in you know, those kinds of energy applications. Um, uh, so we'll get kind of rudimentary uh, introduction over the next couple of slides. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about where lift or a little bit more about where lift comes from in those last one or two classes. Um, but for now, just to deal with data, um, we're going to encapsulate uh, lift force or describe lift forces or do calculations about lift forces and basically the same, using the same relationship that we use for drag. So we'll say the lift force is some coefficient of lift times one half rho V squared times A, right? The same expression we had for drag. Um, the uh, major difference that you'll see, um, and we've talked about this before, but this A is normally the plan form area or the area when viewed from above. Because um, in practice, um, in, uh, in real experiments on airfoils, right, lifting bodies, things where, which, where we intend them to produce lift, um, typically increasing the surface area, for example, of a wing um, tends to increase the lift force. And so we tend to um, uh, write this in terms of that plan form area, like the surface area of the wing, um, or really the projected area of the wing looking down at it. Uh, Another note here is that for lifting bodies, so for airfoils, basically, um, we normally change our definition of drag where we're gonna use the plan form area most of the time as well. Um, we talked about this, you all be careful, right? When you see a CD, make sure you know what area is required for using that CD. But just know that the convention for, um, you know, for like drag on a sphere or when we were looking at drag on um, you know, a, a cyclist, right? That was the area that we're talking about there is the projected area looking um, in the direction of flow. Um, but if we're talking about uh, drag on an airplane wing, we're normally gonna be talking about the plan form area, which is the area projected looking downwards. Yes, Emmy. Yeah, could a cyclist do something where they get some lift force as well? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, a good example, so a better example than a, than a cyclist um, getting a lift force would be like an F1 car, right? So in Formula One, there's a lift force. Um, they wanna know what direction is the lift force on a Formula One car? Down, it's still a lift force, right? Even though it's not pointing up, um, it is still a force um, that is perpendicular to the flow. It just so happens that in F1 car, the objective is to reduce, is to increase down force. Right, to get more grip on the tires or one of the objectives. Um, and so uh, the lift force um, is directed downwards to keep those tires planted on the, on the uh, tarmac, you know, even more. Um, so yeah, certainly possible. Um, in, uh, there's some discussion of like some, and some of the wheels on, on bicycles have like enormous um, sections, enormous uh, rim depth now um because you can make them out of carbon fiber composites they have these like basically airfoil shapes um that could be pretty wide um and in a slight so if you have uh, a crosswind so you have some wind coming at a slight angle um there's some discussion now over whether or not that can create a, a component of force which is in the direction of the motion of travel um as in a lift force um, over the surface of the, is in whether or not the lift force over the, over the um, wheel can actually help propel you forward. Um, so that's also a force, that's also a lift force, 
um, because uh, it is, we're talking about it, something that is in a direction perpendicular to the direction of the uh, airflow. So yeah, it's certainly possible to have lift forces on objects that are on the ground as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, so we just define lift force generally as um, the component of the aerodynamic force, which is perpendicular to the direction of flow. It could be oriented downwards. Um, actually, in a sailboat, um, the lift force is what propels the sailboat forward. Um, and there, you can think of the sail as a wing that's sticking up vertically out of the water. Right? And the lift force is the component of the force on the sail, which is um, directed perpendicular to the direction of the oncoming apparent wind. Um, and that's what actually projects a sailboat forwards. But the lift force doesn't always have to be up, right? It's just perpendicular. It's the component of aerodynamic force perpendicular to the direction of flow. It's like how an acceleration doesn't have to be, right? In physics, you learn that an excel you can have a negative acceleration, right? Acceleration doesn't have to be speeding up, right? Your the brake on your car is technically an accelerator in physics speak because it decreases the velocity of your car. Okay, so um, some notes on coefficient of lift. Um, lift and drag of an airfoil, we're talking about an airfoil. Um, it's a strong function of angle of attack or alpha. So this is an image from um, uh, National Committee for Fluid Mechanics Films showing an airfoil that's fully stalled, right? This is not a situation if you're uh, flying in an airplane and, and you think that's what's happening around your wing, I think you're in trouble, but because um, the boundary layer there has fully separated from the top of the airplane wing. Um, and this would no longer be generating, um, actually would be generating quite a lot of lift, but would have also enormous amounts of drag. Um, this plane would no longer be flying. Um, but uh, that angle of attack alpha, right, is the angle of the airfoil to the oncoming stream. Um, and your lift and drag of the airfoil are both very strong functions of that angle of attack. Um, the, uh, and there are, um, but there are also many other ways to increase lift. So this is what essentially what flaps are for, right? So if you see flaps on, um, you know, if you're sitting next to the wing on your next flight um, and you see the flaps extended for uh, takeoff or landing, um, those flaps are there to, uh, to increase the lift on um, on the wing during those uh, periods of flight where the, the plane is traveling really slowly. Yeah, Abby. Yeah, so the question is when you look at the plane, the, the flaps don't typically go down that far. Um, yeah, you don't need to move it very much to increase the lift, right? You don't need to disturb the airflow very much to increase the lift. Now, this is kind of, this is a very extreme angle of attack, but the angle of attack that we're talking about is typically like five degrees or less. I mean, we're talking about small angles of attack to generate lift force. Um, the, uh, right, I mean, here, this is a plot of uh, lift force versus angle of attack um, for these different uh, configurations of, uh, you know, of flaps on airfoils. Um, we're not really, we're not gonna talk about like what all these different flap designs are, um, but you see that um, all of these curves basically like fall over at a certain point. That's the point where stall occurs. And you can see that's mostly like right around 10 degrees, right? So we're talking about pretty small angles um, of the airfoil to the oncoming flow, right? Because if you get much above 10 degrees, that's where you start having to stall. Um, yeah, so small, so this is exaggerated, but small, um, small changes can have large impacts on lift. So why don't we keep the flaps extended for the whole flight? If it increases lift force, why wouldn't you keep the flaps extended the whole time? Drag, right? The, the answer is drag. So doing this, doing this increases drag really dramatically, um, you know, which is okay. You can burn a little extra fuel to take off and land safely at low speed. Um, but for, uh, for long-term flight, like the economics of uh, running an airline depend mostly on fuel costs. So you wanna minimize that as much as possible, yeah. Yeah, so what causes it to stall? Um, that's boundary layer separation, right? So stall is when the boundary layer separates substantially from the upper surface, right? So 
Um, remember, if we've seen images, I didn't show it here because it's like a little bit more boring, but in um, uh, images of an airfoil at low angle of attack in a wind tunnel, like in uh, like from the album of fluid motion book, um, you know, the streamline just smoothly moves or streamlines just smoothly move around that airfoil, right? Um, with, with very little visible wake behind. Um, and that, in that case, the boundary layer is remaining attached over the airfoil for its whole length. Um, and you're getting uh, maximum lift to drag ratio, essentially, on that airfoil. Um, so yeah, so stall is when you, when you have that separation, now your drag force goes through the roof. Um, and now your jet engine is no longer powerful enough to propel you forward fast enough to fly. So um, this comes with a penalty, right? The penalty of increasing lift, doing any of these things to increase lift is increased drag. And so we can't just you know, arbitrarily fly with all of these things extended. Um, we'd have um, a corresponding increase in drag as well, okay? All right, any questions on this? This is kind of like the Kemi's brief introduction to lifting forces, but there's obviously a huge amount more we could, we could cover here, um, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this class. Okay, any questions on uh, drag or external flow? This is basically the end of our chapter seven, um, you know, brief excursion into discussion of external flow. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the question is, what does it mean for something to be immersed? Um, yeah, that just means it's fully submerged, right? Um, so the, in contrast to that would be um, like a boat is not fully immersed in, uh, in water. It's at the interface between air and water, and then you have other drag components to worry about. If it's immersed, we're not dealing with buoyant forces. That's not true, right? There can be buoyant forces, right? So imagine you have like a, the settling particle. I wish someone doing the viscometer lab were here, but if, the, if you have a settling particle, the, um, uh, then the force that's, let's so say you have a settling particle that's moving downwards at um, terminal velocity. That means that the drag force that's exerting upwards on the particle is balanced out by the net buoyant force downwards on that particle, All right? So that would be the, um, the weight of the sphere uh, minus the weight of the water displaced by the sphere. So buoyancy does matter there. Now, most of the time, like if we're considering a steel ball bearing dropping in water, right? That difference in density is so large that you just ignore the density of water mostly, right? Um, but if you have, um, you know, something that's closer to the, the density of water, then, then yeah, you definitely have to include buoyancy there. Okay. Um, 